deadline. And then the rest of us have to come in and go, mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. not really the way it goes. So he scratched you know. his nose. So I like the fact that you guys at least talk about that and acknowledge the whole idea of just because somebody does one thing doesn't mean they are completely, you know, off the rails. You know, if I'm looking to the right, it could just be because, you know, my friend is there and I keep looking yeah. over to yep. them for support. Sure. So I yep. like the fact that you guys all engage in those kinds of conversations. So, but okay, we're 12 minutes late now because of me, 13, so <laughs> I'm ready. All right, yeah. great, great. We usually well, for half an hour. Oh, we do, yeah. yeah. So and we, we cut all that out. Yeah, good, yeah. good. All right, everybody ready? Yeah. Yep. All right, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train uh, law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. I just finished my first book for Callisto Publishing, which should be out, I think, in the in the fall, hopefully. And I'm also a keynote speaker, and I speak at universities and companies around the world. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, anti-terror, a whole lot of that other stuff. And then I'm a body language and behavior guy. I've written 10 books about body language and behavior. Today, I'm mostly tied up with business, corporate America, and Wall Street. And I have a book called The Most Dangerous Business Book You'll Ever Read. Okay. Chase? Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military and got out. Now I teach interrogation and behavior profiling to businesses and law firms around the world. I teach courses in enhanced persuasion and influence, and I'm a trial consultant. Excellent. Mark? Hi there. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. And we have a special guest today. Tanya Ryman. Tanya, tell us about yourself. Hi there. So I am Tanya Ryman. Yes, I'm the author of three books, uh, all on nonverbal communication as well as manipulation. And we always say manipulation in a bad way. So I like to say manipulation is nothing more than showing someone something that they need to see and then pulling out their own bias. So I'm proud to say I help people with manipulation. And I do so not only nonverbally, when I do my speeches, verbally, when I tell people what they should and should not be saying. And then also, like I said, three books, all to help people get to where they want to be. Excellent. Excellent. Greg, you want, uh, you got a thing you want to talk about? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think war stories is what we really want to talk about, right? Every one of us here, Chase and I both have probably real war stories, but we all have war stories. Everybody tells something. And before we even go into this thing today, I think it's important for us to say every time you open that war story, you're looking for misses. If I told you I ran over an ostrich in the road today, that might be good enough if you know I live near an ostrich farm. But otherwise, I have to go back and edit that to make it believable as I go through. And if I forgot something, every time I open it and, and edit it, I'm adding a little detail to it that the next time I tell that story, I have to inject that information and retell the story. And that's going to generate some fight or flight in most people because they're uncertain how to be perceived. And I think we're going to see a fair amount of that in this story. And as we walk through it, I want to make sure we think about that from a war story point of view. And I'm sure you guys all have comments to interject to that. All right. Well, let's get right to it. Let's, we're going to be today. We're going to be talking about um, Tara Reed and her interview with Megan Kelly. And uh, we're going to talk about what we see happening in that. Now, as we go through this, keep in mind as professionals, as we do this for a living, there's no politics here for us. We don't lay on one side or the other when it comes to, to tell what we see. If we see what we think is deception, we'll say we think this is deception because of this, this, and this. If we see something we think is being is truth, we'll say that we think it's true because of this, this, and this. Or there's showing uh, cues of, of being honest or truthful. So that's where we're sitting. So as we go through this, keep in mind, we're not on anybody's side or anybody's team. We're going right down the middle, and we call them like we see them every time. Okay, so that's that's where we're headed with this. So let's start with the uh, first clip. It's fairly short. There's a day mm -hmm. at some point that spring, spring mm -hmm. of 1993. Correct. Where you say Senator Biden and you had an experience in a hallway in one of the Capitol buildings. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you describe what happened that day? Yes, I was... This was during that time where I was kind of frozen out, so I was kind of surprised. But she, but Marianne came rushing in with this bag, like a duffel bag or gym bag, she called it, and said, you know, hurry, the senator's already on his way. Um, just uh, follow him and try to catch him before the Capitol and give him this. He wants his bag. But I remember going down the Russell Building floors, and so I don't know if I was in the first floor of the 
or the basement, but there's corridors that lead to the Capitol and that kind of thing. And I was trying to catch up with him. And this would have been on a weekday. Okay, Chase, what do you got? So we right away, we have the large inhale before she starts talking. Could be nothing, could be something. We would need to go to the baseline. One of the things I would think here is that she's a little bit exasperated and she's told this so many times and I think she's nervous. This is probably the biggest interview she's done in a while. And right out of the gate, we have her start to use these feeling type of words where she's describing things in sensory terms, where she says, I was frozen out, not cast out or kicked out or voted out. It was frozen out. So we're starting to hear her use some of these feeling words, which may come in later. And everything else looked pretty honest to me. I look for truth signals. I know Greg and Scott, I, we come at it from different angles. I search for truth signals and the lack of truth signals. And this one had mostly truth. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to pick up on what um, Chase is saying there around the metaphor used there, which is um, uh, frozen out. So obviously, ice doesn't actually exist in this situation. It's, it's an idea of something else is imposed on an emotion. And she also talks earlier on and later on about iciness as well. Now, both of these, iciness and frozen out, frozen out of something, means she's talking about a social situation. I just want to kind of lay that down, that there's already talk here that this isn't necessarily about individuals, it's about groups. We're social mammals, so every time we think we're talking about individuals we're not we're talking about members of groups and i just want people to keep that in their mind as we go through this that when we think we're seeing an individual we're seeing a member of a group and they feel either part of a group or not part of a group and if they don't feel part of a group that can cause a huge amount of animosity and emotion so i'm just going to kind of lay that down as a bit of foreshadowing all right tony what do you got yeah. I love all that, especially the foreshadowing piece, because that's exactly what I picked up on. I mean, I do look at things along the lines of which way is she looking? And bizarrely, you know, she looked to the left and to the right pretty much the same amount of time. But that does show to me remembering or maybe just not even falsifying, but maybe putting pieces together that she doesn't fully remember. But I thought it was really important to note not just the words and how she responded, but also the look on her face. So when we see her at certain points, her head is tilting one side and primarily she tilts to the right. And at a certain point, you see her start tilting to the left. And when that happens again, I go from baseline so when you deviate from the baseline, that becomes a real red flag to me. Not to say she's lying, but just to say, what happened? What, what did I miss? So it drives me crazy because I want to say to Megan, this is what you should have said next. Yeah. This is what your next question should have been. Because if you would ask this question, we'd be able to see a lot more. And that's my frustration. So that's my piece. Uh, all right, Greg? Yeah, I think you're starting to see a pattern of, remember I talk about war stories, and when someone has to recall the war story and figure out how it fits into their life, you're starting to see that pattern. If I tell you a story today, and then I realize I'm going for my big show, I'm going to hit on some of the same things you guys hit on. This is a big show. This is, a, Mark, you said it before, a big camera. This is a thing where she realizes she's on the hot spot. She has to now tell the story in a believable way. So you're thinking of holes in your story, even if, they're, even if it's truth you're going to tell because you're trying to dredge up all that memory, watch your eyes. She's accessing left, right. And Tanya, I, I'm with you. I believe that the down right is, this is an emotional thing. I think we're seeing that. But she's dragging information in. When she is injecting something or interjecting something she hasn't said yet, watch this. She locks eyes very closely. Mm -hmm. It's the inject she locks eyes on. It's not the stuff she's said a million times. Right. And I know she's trying to make her story right. It doesn't mean she's lying. But it, if I were interrogating her or if I were questioning her to your point, I would certainly go, ding, there's an indicator for me to wonder why. And ask more questions. Yes. doesn't mean she's lying. It means she has fight or flight around it. And she's been trying to make this story fit. Excellent. Well, the thing that's bug bugging me the most about this is the edit. And there are several edits through here. And I'll point them out. I can't help it because it gives me the feeling we're not getting the whole story. We're not getting the whole answer. Because there are 
differences when she's talking in the room sound between the edits, which, and she's talking a little bit louder, not a whole lot, just a little bit, but the, the, that's what's happening. Uh, and that, so that bugs me from the word go. But that, that's but that's uh, not just to interrupt for one quick minute and tell you, I, I saw that and it drove me crazy. It, it's, as somebody, I mean, we've all been on TV, so we always notice when there's a cut and a pace and that cut and pace mm. makes me crazy too, because suddenly you see her in one frame and then you know that next frame isn't the next frame. It's a frame that's been cut and pasted. And then and God knows where. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, yeah, so you, you recognize that it's put together and that is frustrating for people like us who have to kind of go into each space and say what's real, what isn't, what happened, what didn't. So thank you. That, right. That's an excellent right. point. As we go along, we'll see these edits get even more. There, there are multiple edits in a very short amount of time, but we'll, we'll get to that when it's important because there's so many of them. Yes, I was this was during that time where I was kind of frozen out. So I was kind of surprised, but she, but Marianne came rushing in with this bag, like a duffel bag or gym bag, she called it, and said, you know, hurry, the Senator's already on his way. Um, just uh, follow him and try to catch him before the Capitol and give him this, he wants his bag. But I remember going down the Russell building floors. And so I don't know if I was in the first floor of the, or the basement, but there's corridors that lead to the Capitol and that kind of thing. And I was trying to catch up with him and- All right. So we all got everybody good on that one? Mm -hmm. Good. All right, let's move to the next one. And this would have been on a weekday? Yes. And I remember like my heels, like my legs hurting a little and like, you know, there was just from walking really fast. I remember things like that. Um, and then I saw him at a distance. He was talking to someone and they, they walked away the other direction. And then he greeted me. He remembered my name. And then I said, you know, here you go, Senator. I handed him the bag and it happened very quickly. I remember, I remember being pushed up against the wall um, and thinking the first thought I had was, where's the bag? Which is an absurd thought, but that's what I thought was, the where's the bag? All right, so right out of the gate, this bugs me because I can tell she's been coached. Chase, I know you can you can tell this as well. Greg, you can too. I'm sure you, uh, Tanya and Mark, you can see this as well. She's using terms that you have people use when you train them to say to recall to, to tell their story again. She doesn't use the, the 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 I remember those two words anywhere except when she's talking about this specific thing. And she's telling stories where, she, where things had happened and she's walking her through, you know, different parts in the, in the entire interview, especially at the first. But never, but within a two minute period, she says, I remember seven times. And then uh, once more later on. That's the thing that, that, that bugs me to death. And then um, these are, she's coming to stopping points where she has sections. She tells the story in sections and she comes to a point and her voice goes down and she stops and it starts again. I'll get into more of that as we go along because it gets even heavier up through here. Mark, what'd you see? Yeah, well, the same. This, uh, how many, I, I haven't counted how many times we hear the word, I remember, remember, but this is clearly an important thing that we understand as the audience of this, that all of this is remembered. So that's clearly important. So, so initially I go, why, why do you need to know that why do I need to know, especially that you really remember this? Are you worried that, I'll, that I'm thinking you've made it up? So. Okay. Uh, Tanya, what do you see? You know, that's a good point. The whole thing, well, I'm trying to just make sure I get the notes right. But typically when she says, I remember, she looks to her left. Like when she goes, I remember, it tends to be a left look, whether it's up, side, down, but either which way on top of that, if you notice in this clip, this is where you see a little bit of preening and she also lifts her chin up. So when you say coaching, I think, mm, yeah, because you know, you feel good about something. What do you do? You lift your chin up because you feel powerful. Right. And then on top of that, you, you notice that she shows that important feeling as if, this is my moment and I'm gonna get it right no matter what happens. So a lot of times when we're looking at people, we're thinking, oh, they're coached, they're, they're, they're too positive. Here, you can actually see the coaching and that's discouraging for me. All right, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, so a couple of things. This one, I see a lot of eye accessing. And, and Tanya, I agree with you. I think she's a left baseline for memory. She's mm-hmm. going to the right for a handful of things, and it's usually associated with feeling. But when she's moving her eyes around, that's a good sign. That means she's accessing something. Right. Interestingly for me, I call that I'm just a girl showing vulnerability when they uncover their ear. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. You do it all the time. It's I know it. Powerful. I know it. <laughs> and it, she... She does it very effectively, and honestly, I think this is her starting her story, because I think she's on the hero's path, as I've told you guys before. She's covering her, she uncovers her ears, she starts to tell you about something that's real to her, and she's using memory. She's accessing something. I don't think she's lying, I think she's just starting to personalize herself. Yeah. Awesome, okay, Chase, what do you got? All right, so we open the clip, we've got two more sensory descriptions right out of the gate. Her feet are hurting, she remembers being pushed up against the wall. So more sensory descriptions of the scene. And once it's in keeping and we, and I'm in an interrogation and Greg and Scott probably know this. If it's, if it's truthful and if someone's recalling something in sequence, we'll continue to see that sensory reference. So they'll continue, they'll, they may deviate a little bit, but we'll continue to see that throughout the rest of the conversation, get sensory feelings out of the rest of it. The hair pushback, I don't think was coached. I think that was a natural, genuine gesture that she was, you know, she's probably learned throughout her life, makes people respond a certain way. And I don't think it was deliberate. Like she thinks, oh, right. this is going to make me more innocent. Right. And the, the one thing, she, she doesn't show emotion or recall when she's saying, I remember. So that tells me that there's some coaching involved. And an, another reason that she could be told to say that is that if the facts are ever brought into question, if I'm, if somebody's coaching her, one of some, one of us is coaching her, if the facts are brought into question, I didn't say it happened exactly like this. I said, I remembered it like this. Two caveats to what you said, Chase. One, she acted out the being pushed back against the wall too, which is a really good indicator. When someone says he shook his finger at me and they don't shake their finger, I go, wait a minute, hold on. And, and the other one, that fusible link thing, I think is key. That is deniability. That's that's coaching. Yeah. Right. But remember, she's an expert witness is the last thing to remember. No, but you know what? The, you just hit on something. I, several times she said something like physical. It was a physical. And she pulls herself back. And that yeah. was something that I keyed on, too. I'm like, when you do that, that's not something you get coached on. That's a, literally, that's just built in. It's an inane thing. You go, uh, you know, I, I pushed on. Poof. And then your body moves backwards. So I did see that as well, and I thought that was important. And this would have been on a weekday? Yes. And I remember, like, my heels, like, my legs hurting a little. And, like, you know, there was just from walking really fast. I remember things like that. Um, And then I saw him at a distance. He was talking to someone, and they, they walked away the other direction. And then he greeted me. He remembered my name. And then I said, you know, here you go, Senator. I handed him the bag. And it happened very quickly. I remember, I remember being pushed up against the wall um, and thinking the first thought I had was, where's the bag? Excellent. Anybody else? Are we good? All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, it was, the where's the bag? Yeah, because I was handing it to him. And um, he had his hands um, under, underneath my clothes. and. Um, it was, it happened all at once. So he had one hand underneath my shirt and the other hand, um, I had a skirt on and he like went down my skirt and then went up. And I remember I was up almost on my tippy toes. And um, when he went inside the skirt, he was talking to me at the same time and he was leaning into me and I pulled this way away from his head, I remember. And so he was kissing my neck area and he whispered, did I want to go somewhere else? In a low voice. He said some other things. I can't remember everything he said. Um, But he said um, something vulgar. And- May I ask what? All right, Tanya, what do you got? Okay, so once again, we see the hair flip. And I, I think that's true. As a woman, I can speak to this. We often just go, you know, or, or like this, you know, or I might just one day, you know, go like this. It's, it's, we have long hair. So a lot of times it's part of what we do. It just, it is a comforting gesture. There's no doubt about that. We do it because 
It makes us feel better, right? Mm -hmm. But on top of that, when we look, this is the first time, well, not the first time, but for this clip, we see an increase in her blink rate, which if you watched her throughout, her blink rate was pretty stable. Here we see her do like an eyelash flutter. She, her rate increases. And then as she talks, you can see she physically pulls herself up and to the right. So once again, we're talking about how she's telling the story and almost acting it out for herself, not necessarily to look believable, but because she's reliving that experience. And this is where I thought to myself, hmm, when she says this, and her head tilts a little bit more than it typically does, once again, those are signals. Because if you watched her, her head tilted primarily to the right. And on certain occasions, you would see that tilt go a little bit deeper, and then it would go to the left. So you were like scratching your head like, mm, what's right and what's wrong? But here we see her head tilts a little bit deeper. And with the other pieces, I think that this was organic. I think it was genuine. I don't think it was coached. Okay, Chase, what do you got? Completely agree with the blink rate. We saw the blink rate go up. And for, the, for you watching this, if, if we start blinking more often, so blink rate is just how often, not really how fast. So if our blink rate goes up, that's typically a stress indicator. And t the, the newest, most recent research on deception shows that blink rate drops during the lie and has a sharp increase after the deceptive point. And we see this. She's reliving something that was a stressful event, and the blink rate confirms it. And we see lots of movement here as well with the, the chin boss as she's starting to recall some of this stuff. So this was, this was a genuine statement. Okay. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I think the, the, when you see the blink rate increase because of stress, I think it may be related to the fact she's now divulging more detail than she's divulged anywhere else. And we're back to that. I've got an inject. I've got information. I'm worried about – watch the hypnotic gaze. She's looking right at her, right? Right at her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because she's afraid of how this is going to be perceived. Whether – what how – good the details are, our memories distort, delete, and generalize things. So whatever she has to, to bring forward is suspect at this point. Look at us. We're all looking at her. And she's keenly aware of that. So she's keeping eye contact to make sure how it's being perceived. I think that causes her blink rate to increase, Chase, in this case, because there is fear. There is fight or flight. There, I guarantee you, her. if you could test hormones right now, you would get all kinds of stress hormones in this case. You bet. Completely agree. And I, I also What's think that, that the, the, recognize the idea that just like with any of us or with any natural human being, right, as we're, we're on autopilot, typically, yes. but when we're first in any kind of engagement, we're really self-aware, right? We, we're, we're just right there and we're recognizing all of our own movements and statements and we're really hyper aware. But as time goes on, it's impossible. It's It would be so tiring to keep up on all those things that suddenly you cannot recognize where's my eye going how many times right. am i blinking right. uh, am i slumping and you know all these things go out the window so as time goes on in the interview you also and i think we'll discuss this i'm sure you'll bring this up but you know we we start to fall back on what we are trying to keep sustained and that's when you start to really recognize where the signals are well, one of the things I think is great, and that's a, that's a good call out, Tanya, one of the things I think is great about this group is each of us is capable of reading each other, and yet we're not worried about it. We're just yeah. sitting here talking, and that's hard for people to do that know that we can do this, but I think we all have learned, yeah, yeah, so what? Yeah. And, yeah. and, right? <laughs> right. All right, Mark, what are you seeing? Yeah, so my guess is, is some people, you know, maybe watching this right now, maybe what you're thinking is, uh, but she's acting, you know, she's putting on a good show. I've got some experience around this. I've trained actors all over the world and some of them have won Oscars. So I know really good actors and I know how they do what they do and I can help them do what they do. To be able to drift into that emotional recall as she just did then and do it when it just kind of flows in and then suddenly peaks that's super hard to do as an actor. Most actors, even really good ones, will actually steer past the emotion. It's, it's 
too awful for the body to take. And what they'll tend to do, amateurs or even good enough professionals, they will avoid the pain. The pain for her flows up and then peaks immediately. And, and after that, she, she wouldn't be in control of that. If it's a real feeling, she'd have to try really hard to suppress it or it would just come. So if she's acting, she, she's beyond the capability of most really good actors. Right Let Bell Legger watch out. Was that it? Yeah. So, so. <laughs> you yeah. Your own I'm not self. saying. Look, you know, some she could have been lurking in the background as a, as a, as an Oscar winner. Yeah. Somewhere, but that is super unlikely because the amount of training you have to take in order to do what she just did. Then, I don't think she's done that training. So I'm going to say that emotional recall that happened there was absolutely true and what we're going to see later on is it's true enough with somebody live in the room that they start to have full empathy for her we'll start to see our interviewer there uh, go red in her eyes just like she's doing we'll see the emotions become contagious it's good enough to do that to somebody who's actually trying to stay quite reserved at the moment so if it's a performance, it's an unbelievable performance, which I would therefore say it's not a performance. It's the real thing. Okay. I think she's told this story so many times. She sees her stopping points there waiting for Megan's emotion. That's when she's told this story. She tells it and people go, oh, my gosh. And then they start talking as she's ending that little that little part there so it's, I, I get the feeling she's almost waiting on that as that happens almost to to reassure that she's heading down the right road or doing the right thing but megan doesn't give her that at the same time again we're seeing an edit in there we may not be seeing it but there's an edit in there and again you can hear the difference in her in her voice volume when it's when it ends and when it starts again and uh that that again bugs me the editing in this is is atrocious actually it, it bugs me too so i'm glad that you bring that up because i feel that same kind of yeah emotive like uh, suddenly you go come on now i know yeah. yeah i know that but yes i agree thank you thank you for pointing that out it's good okay. right, so i'm gonna keep doing it bugs the squat out of me all right everybody good <laughs> uh, was where's the bag yeah because i was handing it to him and um he had his hands um under underneath my clothes and um it was, it happened all at once. So he had one hand underneath my shirt and the other hand, um, I had a skirt on and he like went down my skirt and then went up. And I remember I was up almost on my tippy toes. And um, when he went inside the skirt, he was talking to me at the same time and he was leaning into me and I pulled this way away from his head, I remember. And so he was kissing my neck area and he whispered, did I want to go somewhere else? In a low voice. He said some other things. I can't remember everything he said. Um, but he said um, something vulgar. And may I ask what? All right, let's go to the next one. And may I ask what? He, he said, I want to fuck you. And he said it low and I was pushing away. And I remember my knee hurting because our knees, he, he had opened my legs with his knee and our knees caps clashed. So I felt like this sharp pain. His fingers were inside of my private area, my vagina. And um, it, it wasn't, there was no small talk. There was no like precept. There was, it was just sudden and it was happening like that. And he, um, was saying that to me, saying those things to me, and I was pulling away. All right, Tanya, what do you got? Okay, so a few things here. Uh, while she's talking several times, so she says, I remember my knees hurting, uh, I felt a sharp pain, and then again, this is one time that she goes up to the left, so it's a little bit of a strange encounter, but, you know, again, sometimes we remember and sometimes we just need, we remember, but we fill in the blanks. On here, though, I noticed that she does two things. Number one, she has this, like, extended eye closure. So when you're talking and you go, I remember that. It's one of two things. Either you don't want 
to show what you're feeling. You don't want the world to know that you are potentially exaggerating, being deceptive, or feel anxiety. But on top of that, it's also to keep out the negative feelings that you're experiencing at that moment. But on top of that, what I noticed was once she does that, she tilts her head. Like you see this little tilt and then she goes like this but it's very minute so you have to be looking for that slight head negation and that's again we're looking at contextually what she's doing so she's either shaking her head like this like i don't want to remember this because her eyes are closed or it's a red flag it's one or the other so we have to look at the big context and we can do that in the big at the end of this but you know there is the two things the subtle things the eye closure, the extended eye closure, and then that slight head negation that put me on to a hmm question. Okay, cool. Mark? Yeah, so I want to follow up again on, on ideas around why this isn't acting and why it isn't made up. Have you been to a film and it's taken one, two, three, four, five people to work out what's happening in a specific moment of a scene? On the whole, what an actor is trying to do is tell you a really clear narrative and a really, really clear emotional journey that flows really smoothly. It may be like a bit of a roller coaster, but it's very clear where we are and what's happening. And the very fact that it's taking us to go, well, I think there's this little thing happening here and this happening over here, and that doesn't quite fit with that, means that, look, if this is uh, absolutely made up, and fully, fully rehearsed, then it's a really bad job of making stuff up and fully, fully rehearsing it because it's quite confusing emotionally what's going on at the moment. And people are pretty confusing or they're pretty complex. So there's a level of complexity here that anybody who is interested in putting on a good story and rehearsing it well, there's a level of complexity here that they wouldn't be trying to achieve. They'd be trying to achieve something way simpler to understand, way better and more smoothly delivered. Excellent. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, again, here, red flaggy. I watched this thing four times before I finally said, okay, I believe her mostly. Because I kept seeing this piece where she would hypnotizingly stare when she's telling information before I started to analyze that she's also accessing until she comes to it and then look at the story that she's told her entire life. That's repetitive. That's that left auditory cue, right? I'm listening. I'm paying attention to something I've said, something I've repeated over and over and over. My favorite piece of poetry. It's how you memorize things. And then this focus, and this is what makes it difficult. The staring focus and no accessing cues makes it awkward. It makes you start to think, hmm, why is she not accessing information? But then when you go back and think about, she is concerned that she will not be believed. And this might be fact. It might be what she remembers. It might be what she's dredged up in the past few days as a memory, but it might be exactly what, how she remembers it. She just has never said it. And the perception of being mistaken for a liar is there. And cer certainly the other piece is she's adapting when she's saying this. I hear you know, we'll call them comfort moves or adapters. It's making the uncomfortable comfortable. Do something over and over and over. Humans all do it. You can hear her rubbing her thigh, which is a really classic one. And her body's starting to rock a little. So it, I don't think most of the time that people are lying and they're trying to be hypnotic in their stare, they also adapt. That's not typical. They want you to believe them so their hands are up and they're doing all of that. I'm, I believe something happened. The details need more to your point, Tanya, let me ask the question. This would be a different interview. Of course, maybe not as comfortable either, so. Uh, Chase? <laughs> uh, I agree with uh, everybody here. I think we, we saw another instance of the feeling words. So as, as, as an interrogator, and you're, you're learning this, watching right now, we're listening for deviations from that. So now you're learning, you can do this in any conversation. You start having a conversation, we're listening for those those small little indicators, and we're looking for a deviation from that later on in the conversation. Greg is, I could say the word obsessed with baselining <laughs> behavior. And in fact, that's what we're doing. This is we're, bag. We're developing that baseline and looking for changes in that, change detection. 
And I saw the same uh, squint, which personally I believe was something, if you have somebody recall traumas, especially people who are coming back from combat, you'll see a very similar squint. And I think the eye contact was somebody coaching her and say, all right, Terry, remember you got to make good eye contact. You have to make eye contact in that interview. I have that written as a myth at the top of my page in my notes. She believes the myth. <laughs> well, it, but at the same time, that myth is what keeps us going, right? So right. we all believe the myth. And then, again, we go back to there's two sides. Oh, uh, don't believe the, the, the whole concept that if you hold eye contact, you're being honest. But also don't believe that liars can't hold eye contact. There, it's, it's all bullcrap. Right. Yeah. So the yeah. bottom line is it, it does all go back to baselining at least a minimum of information. And you, you have to have some kind of idea of what somebody typically does. And I think I said this earlier, but I think that makes the point of when you're five minutes into the interview, there's going to be a difference than when you're 25 minutes into the interview, because by 25 minutes, your brain is tired and you, you just go back to autopilot. So where in five minutes, you were like, yes, I have to keep that eye contact. I have to make sure I'm looking and it's important. But after a few minutes, you, you start to just go back to who you are naturally. And that's what happens, no matter how much coaching you have. And Mark, I know that you do this constantly. And trust me, I've I've done it with politicians and it's incredibly frustrating when you tell them what to do and then you watch them and you go, are you freaking kidding me? I told you 18 times, do this. And then you, what, you fell asleep? What? You were sitting on stage and I said, don't do that. And you did that. But it's because they just kind of got tired mentally, went back onto autopilot and forgot what they were supposed to do or couldn't keep up with what they were supposed to do. So, yeah. Well, to that 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 point, To that point, one of the things that I would be coaching her with exactly and and do with people in her position is that the audience of this show, uh, they like the anchor. That's why they tune in, because they believe the anchor is something like them. It holds their values. So I'd be saying to (laughs) train everybody to go, you're going to lock eye contact with that anchor because the camera is going to pick up your eye contact with them and the audience are going to have a relationship with you through that anchor who they kind of believe they are or they share the same values. So what's important is coming up is the anchor getting close to showing exactly the same emotion, which means chances are the audience are there as well. So chances are we've managed to shift the audience that likes this show and likes this anchor into an emotional state. So this is a a potentially a brilliant example of influence and persuasion where you take the nation or certainly the part of the nation that will watch this new show uh, with you emotionally. Excellent. All right. Now I've got two things. Uh, And first off, let me say, I think if we broke into Mark's house and tied up his hands, we wouldn't have to gag him. I don't think he can talk without using, without using his hands, number one. Number two... He's not Italian, is he? Wait, what? No, no, very far no. from... Not much of Italy Very far in there. from Italian. Yeah, but, um, but let's, let's... as While we're talking about learning, and Chase brought up the learning part of it, as when Greg and I were putting together our online course, we, we had this discussion about... He started... He, he was doing a thing on eye accessing. I, on I access and cues. And as, as we all know, my problem with that is the research, hear me out. The research says, Nope, doesn't work. That's, that's not what we're, that's not what we're seeing. Quote, unquote. That's not what's happening. Right? Mm-hmm. He said, really? And I said, yeah. So we got in the hall. He goes, let's go find somebody. So we went out to, to a hall, in the hallway and he started talking to this guy and he said, I'm going to make his, him do this, 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 and this. And I said, oh, well, you know, have at it big time. Let's see this. And of course he did it. He pulled it off. And I was like, you got to be kidding me because all the, the, everything says no. I'm used to seeing, to, to approaching eye access cues as if they're always looking up here, great. But when they start looking over here, something's up. Again, it comes off, that goes off their baseline. And, and from, and I know you look at different places from uh, an emotional standpoint and, and from when you're recalling something from an audio, sta- audio standpoint, but let's talk about that briefly, r- really briefly, um, and clean that up so people understand that we're at, at the spot I was at, and I've always been like, nope, I'm not into that. I understand it from a different perspective. There's a, there's a thing that goes down the NLP um, path right. that is completely. Down that rabbit com- hole that's scary. 
Yeah, yeah no, you, 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 you can't. You, no you can't, facts in it at all. Yeah, you can't use any with any human. Human's body language is like a thumbprint because we right. are like little decorator crabs. We go grab stuff and put it on us. We turn ourselves into a unique thing. And so you have to baseline and figure it out. But if I ask you questions very quickly about, hey, what's your favorite song? And you start rifling through your head, I can figure out where you're going for that kind of memory. That's right. And then, okay. then if I ask you right. to do Thank some you. math, yeah, then you do some math. I see where you go in your head for that. It, that's what you're doing. There no are specific of, for each time you do that. That's, what, well, not no, everybody no, goes no, to the no. same place. Well, with, no. most, with not two individuals who won't go to the same place. That's fact. Every right. person is different. Right. Yeah, the, the only one that I've found that's pretty consistent is this. Eyes down right. Almost always I find people in an emotional state put their eyes down to the right. And if you think about watching people, their head then changes their entire posture because it offsets the balance of their body. So you can see when a person's walking and their head is down, cast down, their eyes are cast down right, it changes their entire posture. And that's the only absolute I know in life. The rest of these you have to poke and prod and find. Chase, you're squishing around over there. What do you got? Yeah, so that's that's I completely agree with Greg. I've never seen research for it, but I've seen evidence of it. Yeah. And I think there is a massive difference between academic based and results based. There is a great chasm in between there. And I agree with Greg that this downright looking is you ask someone about a relative that they lost in their life or you ask somebody about a a, a bad situation that they've been through that we'll we'll typically see that movement. Okay. All right. Just want to clean it up real quick. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Was saying that to me, saying those things to me, and I was pulling away. And then he pulled back immediately when he could see I wasn't complying. I was obviously just tensed up and frozen and not kissing him back and I'm not going with him. And he pulled back and he looked at me and he said, come on, man, I, I heard you liked me. And when he said that, it was either I heard or I thought, but I remember hearing heard. When he said that, I immediately started thinking what I did, like how I brought this on. Like, did I say something to somebody? Did I give an impression? Did I, I was just, my mind was racing. And. All right. I think right in here, we're seeing, she's told this story so many times. She's got stopping points as she tells the section of her story. And that's what we're seeing. Um, especially when she says that my mind was racing. She's almost, sounds like she's almost confused of what's happening, but she's trying to stay on that path that she's always already always taken telling that story so that's what that's looking like to me mark what do you got yeah i just want to note that um the editing here and how there's a specific point there that the producer goes back to kelly to pick up on the start of her emotional journey watching this so there's already um another play going on here around how the uh, the, the interviewer is getting emotionally involved because that's the main way we as the audience are going to get emotionally entangled in this is through the interviewer, not necessarily few, through the interviewee. So just, you know, check out that we're being taken on a journey on purpose here. Okay. Tanya. Oh, this to me was tremendous. I agree. One of the most frustrating things I, I, I think you might all agree uh, is when you have the interviewer ask the question and then the interviewee answer the question, but they're not in the same box. So the most important piece for me is how it's, it's great to hear the answer and to recognize and to look at the cues, but the most important piece for me is the response to the question. So when I can watch somebody being, the, so Megan Kelly's on the left and Tara Reid is on the right, and I can see her response to the question, to me, that's the best time to read someone. Because now we have the answer that could very well be rehearsed. So here, what did we see? We had, she holds eye contact, but then as she talks about it, come on, she knits her brow. She knits her brow in that way, like, it's almost she's reliving that. She knits her brow, she pulls her, she Cups down her chin. So she's playing out Joe Biden's behavior, right? In addition to that, then I, when she talks about things, she's emphatic. So she lifts her brows up and she's like, don't you understand? Don't you get it? So I saw a lot of playing and a lot of behaviors that were most likely real because she's reliving that experience. 
And you see that again, because when, when somebody is pretending, they might tell you the story, but they won't necessarily play out the scene. So watching her doing all these little movements made me think, hmm, that could be a red flag. Again, watching her knit her brow and then do that little sarcastic, contemptuous almost smile. And then having her look up like, what? How would you not believe what I'm saying? It, it's frustrating to me because I want to see them both on camera at the same time. I don't want to see Megyn Kelly reliving her past because I know her past. I think most of us know her past. So, of course, there's going to be that kind of mirror neuron bouncing off of mirror neuron. I want to see... Tara Reed, when she specifically asked the question, her reactions at that moment. So this was good because I do think that she gave us a lot of information, but at the same time, it would have been better if they had a two camera angle for this specific question. That's why that Joe Biden interview was so yes. good because it was just bang, bang. bang. Yeah. And we watched yeah. Yeah. That, those reactions so during yep. the, us who's asking the questions and yeah. we know there's no editing in there. Right. Anyway, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, later on, there's a great example of that, Tanya, and I agree with you. I want to see them ramping up, putting it in their head, see whatever happens to right. the baseline when they're doing it. But this is where I had an epiphany about what she's doing when I was watching the entire video, right here. When she's talking and she's accessing, and then she makes a mistake of saying something differently than she said it in the past, and there's that moment of blink rate increase, and then she starts to work that language in very quickly, and she turns and focuses and stares right in into Megyn Kelly's eyes. Yeah. That is the baseline change that she does. If you go backward and look backward and forward, you'll see anytime she's injecting data and she's uncertain, that's exactly the look. And here it was because she shifted word patterns from what she had said in the past. Other than that, it's a little bit this to me, a little bit rehearsed, yeah. a little bit practiced. But to your point, if I've said something a million times, if you ask me a war story from the Persian Gulf War, I, I probably am going to have a little bit of the same rhythm because I'm yeah to tell the story right we so told it yeah. a million times the, one of the things i was looking for again because she has blue eyes so we're all looking at her pupils i kept looking for you know yep. any kind of dilation yep. is it is it constricting is it dilating i didn't see much of a change which i found to be very interesting actually because even the most unemotional amongst us would show some kind of change. There was no deviation that, that struck me also. But here, I, I, I love what you just said. You're right. When you tell that story a hundred times, suddenly you yeah. don't need to replay it. it there's not going to be a lot of movement because you just know the story so well. Right. It's right. Chase, what's, what's tearing you up over there, Chase? You looked, a, you looked like you had a little thing of uh, not anger, but something was bugging you. What do you got? Oh, not anger. No, please. I think uh, the, we, we see a lack of pupil dilation because she's under some serious lights, like some heavy duty, big time lights. And that's just my, my belief. I think that there's some great stuff in this, in this whole thing. And I think that Greg was talking about making that inject where she wants to clarify, she, I might've used a different word where she says, come on, man, I thought you liked me or I heard you like me. I mean, I knew it was one of those two words. That's when she's injecting. That's when she's, the emotion drops down a little bit and it's a lot more intense contact. But we see her again. She's using feeling words. And as she's a feeling person, like she experiences the world through feeling, not sight and sound, doesn't use those words very much. She is narrating the story with her body. She's narrating with her, her body language. And we, we continue to see that. Nothing bugged you. What? What? You you did this this thing of that looked like you were a little PO'd in there or something. Maybe just you were thinking about something else. But I I saw that and I was like, yeah, I can't wait for this. Nothing. No, nothing. nothing. Okay, it's an off screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Was saying that to me, saying those things to me, and I was pulling away, and then he pulled back immediately when he could see I wasn't complying. I was obviously just tensed up and frozen, and not kissing him back, and I'm not going with him. And he pulled back and he looked at me and he said, come on, man, I, I heard you liked me. And when he said that, it was either I heard or I thought, but I remember hearing heard. When he said that, I immediately started thinking what I did, like how I brought this on. Like, did I say something to somebody? Did I give an impression? Did I, I was just, my mind was racing. And okay, let's go to the next one. Impression, did I, I was just, my mind was racing. And in that moment, 
I knew this was really bad. I knew I was, it was more than just like the assault. It was really bad. He was then angry, right? And I could feel, it wasn't like yelling angry, but like that hostility build. And he pulled back and he was just looking at me directly. And he said, he pointed his finger at me and he said, you're nothing to me. You're nothing. And I, and I think, I, th I think that's the hardest thing. And I know people talk about the assault, but his words, those words stayed with me my whole life. And as I've been trying to tell my story, I kind of been torn apart trying to tell it, those words come back. And it's like, it was, it was not, it was cruel. So when he saw me obviously start to get upset by what he said, he took me by the shoulders and he just kind of shook me almost like, you know, and said, you know, you're okay. You're all right. Had you said anything to him? All right. There are a few things in here. This is where I started getting iffy on this whole thing because as she's, when she starts that cry, when she starts to get emotional and crying, I'm going back to Eggman on this for, micro expressions there's one in there where she's when she's crying you see her smile like a full-blown you know hey smile not that big really bad but that's the part where i said you know what something's up here i think i called you greg after that or sent it to you and said shoot here's what's up and also when she says um he was then angry she's talking like yoda or something people don't talk that way i think what we're hearing is that that box of that that usually you hear loping when somebody's telling it telling the story and it's 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 um, them actually telling the story. But in this case, she's telling these boxes that she's pulled down in sections of that story. She's been through it so many times, she's trying to hit all of her specific points in here. And um, like when she says, it was cruel. It was, it was not, it was cruel. So when he saw me... You know, or he was cruel. The way she says that, there's something up with that. There's something... She's just hitting that point. I have to say, be sure you say he's cruel or be sure you add that part. She's told the story so many times that she's trying to keep those parts in there because she's been told they're, they're important. That's, that's what it looks like to me. And um, got something else. Um, yeah, Scott, one quick thing while you're saying that. Yeah, if, if revenge is your motive for something somebody did to you, you might smile when you realize you've got their foot nailed to the floor. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's, I, that's what I'm, I'm, I'll I'll show you what the, that micro expression, but it really that really tipped me off big time. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so this is where it gets more interesting for me uh, because I think what we see here is her showing us what hostility looks like and what anger looks like, or actually more specifically, hostility. Uh, that that targeted eye contact she gets. Uh, locking the interviewer, which we'll see later on from her several times, helps us understand, I think, what she's thinking and feeling later on in the interview. She calls it here uh, hostility. And she says, uh, here's the hardest thing. You're nothing to me. It was cruel. You're nothing to me. I think this is the actual problem. This is what this is really about this is about being valued does she feel valued and so again i think we're going to see this played out later in this interview the idea of not being a part of the team being iced out being in the cold not being part of the group and the hostility around that and so i think you know ultimately at, at this point we start to get a clue as to what the real agenda might be uh, around this. Now, um, back to, you know, is she, is she making up a story? Is she being deceitful here in any way? That, that quivering that we see here, it's very hard to do. I'm not saying you can't do it. You can do it for sure, but it's super hard to do. And, um, and we get this strong flash from Kelly as well of her emoting as well, mirroring that. Again, tough to get somebody to do that. So there's something very real going on here. There's something very believable going on here. I, I agree with you. And I think the believable part is, and this is what brings into question the gory part we went through earlier, 
whether that really happened or not, because I like I've been I'm under the impression that this is a deflection from that to bring what is really important is this. We're here to talk about the other thing. That's what's bringing this whole thing together. But her saying he doesn't do this. And you're probably right, Mark. That's probably what made her angry enough to say, you know what? Here's what's going to happen. I'm sure right. that, that, that she's, she's being honest about most of this, but I'm not so sure that the gory part happened. Uh, oh, I think, I think you're right. She, she, she says it clearly. The hardest thing is you're nothing to me. Now, yeah, we're not surprised that, that the, the assault yeah. didn't happen or assaults are not hard, but the hardest thing for her, she seems to suggest, is not being valued. When you watch when you watch this entire video, if you watch for when her eyes are the most engaged, and she's really crying. I mean, the sclera of her eye is red. You can see all of that. It's around that topic. It's around that topic in three places in the original story, and then here, and then later when they ask her, "What's the end state? What's the end state?" and she goes in and says, "I want to be valued." She that's where all the emotion is pouring out. All the real emotion in the story. And I think Chase, you're the first guy to bird dog that. But yeah, uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing some of this stuff here. So there, there's, there is some coaching in here. I, I, I have no doubt. But if I'm giving her a truth score instead of a deception score, I'm giving somewhere around 80% here. And mm -hmm. we see her deviate from using feeling words. I saw him step back. He looked at me. And once he saw me and did this. So that could be some of this coaching where she's not going defaulting to that language. Mark said it right out of the gate. She thrives on acceptance, membership of groups and, and, and making a difference. And I, she, I don't know how she feels about it, but I know that this was a much stronger and more dramatic emotional reaction. And the emotional reaction, I would, I would, I would bet my reputation is genuine. That, that is hard to fake. I believe you. I'm, people I'm cry from, people sure. cry from frustration more rapidly than most other emotions. I mean, when they're, when they're really, really emotional and they really are explosively crying, it's often frustration because that's pent up and it can't go anywhere, unlike the rest of emotions we have to learn to deal with. You see Tanya? that in corporate America, right? Tony, what do you got? Uh, I'll go through a few things. Uh, just quickly, I saw, you know, throughout the entire interview, she tends to purse her lips and what you had said I think it was you who said the, like that smile at the end I have a feeling that that was more of a nervous like we can say maybe Duper's the light maybe it was a slight smile a smirk but I have a feeling it was a nervous smile and I'll, I'll tell you why uh being the child of somebody who was abused you know for the first 16 years of my life my mother myself etc um you become I don't want to say hardened but when you tell your story, like my kids love it. They sit on the edge of their seats. They're like, tell us the story when, when daddy, you know, smashed the, the muffler into the windshield. And I can tell that story 10 times over. No emotion will come out because I've told that story so many times. Yes, the glass shattered into my face. Yes, the man was standing there with his eyes enraged. Yes, my mother was next to me terrified. Like I can tell that story now and there's no emotion because I've told it so many times. So I can see where she can get through this story and not have any, I won't say emotional attachment, but be able to discuss it. However, that's when you're talking to people you know who already know your story. If I were telling my story to someone else that I didn't know, then suddenly you, you kind of get this well of emotions that builds up. And even though you want to be able to control it, you can't. So here I did see genuine emotion. I saw... A, he pointed his finger at me, and when he when he says this, she goes, he said, you're nothing to me. And you see a one-sided shoulder shrug. It's very subtle, but at yep. the same time, once again, she's talking to somebody who feels her pain, so to speak, and that little shrug says to me, she felt so insecure at that moment at saying, you're nothing to me, that she felt it. That, that one-sided shoulder shrug said she felt insecure. So here, I definitely believe that she's told this story one too many times, and maybe that's why she doesn't cry each and every time that she's telling a portion of it. But everyone has agreed that thing that said, you're nothing. That self-esteem, that hit in the chest that just says, 
you've done what you've done physically, but now it's all emotional. Now it's up here. So you see her tuck her chin, her chin goes down and, and you just see real emotion there. And I think that that was what she was feeling at that moment. Okay. Impression, did I, I was just, my mind was racing. And in that moment, I knew this was really bad. I knew I was, it was more than just like the assault. It was really bad. He was then angry, right? And I could feel, it wasn't like yelling angry, but like that hostility build. And he pulled back and he was just looking at me directly. And he said, he pointed his finger at me and he said, you're nothing to me. You're nothing. And I, and I think, I, th I think that's the hardest thing. And I know people talk about the assault, but his words, those words stayed with me my whole life. And as I've been trying to tell my story, I've kind of been torn apart trying to tell it, those words come back. And it's like, it was, it was not, it was cruel. So when he saw me obviously start to get upset by what he said, he took me by the shoulders and he just kind of shook me almost like, you know, and said, you know, you're okay, you're all right.